Yeah, we can see okay. the slide. Uh, so um, thanks so much, Afonso. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for organizing this wonderful online conference. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, overlap gap in the context of planted submatrix recovery. Uh, this is based on joint work with David Gomarnik, who's at MIT, and of course Jagannath, who's at the University of Waterloo. Um, so the context for uh, this work uh, lies in the accumulating evidence regarding statistical to computational gaps in high dimensional inference problems. Um, so we've heard quite a few presentations already in this conference regarding this general theme. So I'll keep my background discussion uh, pretty concise, but a summary essentially is that over the past decade, uh, we have had accumulating uh, evidence that uh, in modern high dimensional inference problems, uh, there are regimes where uh, inference might be information theoretically possible, but computationally intractable in the sense that the optimal statistical procedure might require exponential time and any polynomial time algorithm might actually require uh, significantly higher signal strength to actually be efficient. Now, um, there is uh, a lot of evidence or you know there is there is strong reasons to believe that this phenomena is actually quite widespread and appears in in practical problems such as community detection planted clique sparse pca and so on and so forth um now you might naturally wonder okay how how would one go about trying to make sense of this claim and there have been very different approaches to make sense of this uh, statement um, of course, from a computer science viewpoint, people have tried average case reductions. We've heard Matt talk about this uh, in our last sessions. Uh, from a physics viewpoint, as Antoine explained uh, in our last talk, one, it's natural to sort of look at message passing based algorithms and study the state evolution formalism. Uh, one can, of course, look at families of convex uh, relaxation hierarchies and analyze their performance. And, and there are other approaches to this. Um, so today I'll look at only a, a very, very specific uh, problem of this flavor. And instead of these approaches, I'll actually like uh, look at the entire likelihood landscape and uh, try to uh, provide some more evidence regarding computational hardness in terms of uh, the existence of free energy barriers and so on and so forth. Uh, now, so as such, I think so, this sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, just to make sure, did you, are you still in the title slide? No. No, uh, oh. we're still oh, well. seeing the title slide. It was, uh, you know, oh, sorry. it was still do very the clear all you said, even without just the title slide, but just to make sure. Sorry, do you see my slide transitions? No, we just see the title slide. Oh, okay. This, may, yes. Maybe you're not sharing the proper things. Well, at some time it happens with Zoom, you should share. Um... This is a bit try, try preview if PDF uh, Adobe doesn't work. Uh, okay, do you see it now? Yes, now we see slide three. Okay, but, and do you see the transitions? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, great, thank you so okay. much. All right, oh, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so, <laughs> sorry for uh, the inconvenience um, and the confusion, but today I'll talk about a very specific instance of this, and I'll, I'll try to look at uh, the performance of maximum likelihood. Um, so, let me describe the specific setup, right? So in this case, uh, one, one gets to observe an n by n symmetric matrix. Uh, and most of the entries here are uh, centered Gaussians. Uh, however, hidden in this matrix, there is a principal submatrix where the mean has been elevated. Um, so an alternate way to represent this matrix is in terms of a one rank perturbation of a Gaussian matrix, so W here is a symmetric Gaussian matrix that has been appropriately normalized. Um, the vector V uh, in, encodes the support of the planted submatrix, so its entries are zero and one. And uh, today we look at settings where the planted submatrix has uh, size n rho times n rho, where rho here is a constant that's independent of n. Okay. Now, uh, this is a very stylized setting, but it turns out to be relevant uh, and similar in spirit to problems arising in things like sparse PCA and by clustering. So this is what we look at today. And from uh, the, the perspective of computational hardness, the sort of interesting regimes turn out to be when uh, in this double asymptotic limit where n tends to infinity and then rho goes to zero, right? Because then the planted submatrix is sort of a very small fraction of the ambient matrix. Now, um, 
given such a setting, there are certain natural statistical questions of interest. The first and obvious one is, okay, can I actually detect the presence of this submatrix? Um, I'd like to emphasize that in this particular setting, this is easy because one can just test based on the sum of all the elements of the matrix. So you can always uh, detect the presence. And I emphasize this because uh, you might naturally be trying to associate it with things like uh, the low degree likelihood ratio test and, and these features. This problem is of a slightly different flavor in the sense that um, testing at least is easy in this case. However, when you try to start thinking about uh, recovery, you know, you, you have this submatrix, you don't know where it is, you would like to recover its support. This is where things start becoming more interesting. So the basic questions we'll think about today is when can we recover this submatrix and when can we recover it efficiently? So this problem has been looked at in the past. Uh, from the best that I know, uh, this was initiated in, in a work by Deshpande and Montanari, who formulated it as a Bayesian problem. There, the, the entries of the vector V were Bernoulli 0 or 1 with probability rho. Um, their criteria was in terms of recovering the low rank spike matrix. And they established that an AMP-based algorithm would be optimal for uh, rows bigger than some constant row critical. Um, this was followed up on by, in a series of works by uh, Lassier et al. And, and they actually first you know, uh, discovered that in this double asymptotic limit, um, you would expect to have a computationally hard phase in this problem. Um, so today I'll, I'll take a slightly different perspective on this and I'll actually look at the behavior of the maximum likelihood estimator for this problem. Um, if, if we write down the maximum likelihood in this case, uh, it's not too hard to see that it reduces to this following problem. So you naturally try to optimize this quadratic form um, subject to these constraints. Okay. And um, the performance metric that we'll try to look at uh, is something that we call reliable recovery in that we'll try to see whether uh, we recover a constant proportion of the support or not. So for example, you could think of this constant as like 10%, so 0.1, and then you want to know whether you recover uh, a constant fraction of the support of this uh, hidden submatrix. Um, so our first result essentially identifies the information theoretic threshold uh, required for the MLE to actually recover the support in a reliable fashion. And um, the important point I, I want you to note here is that the MLE requires signals which is of the order one over square root rho, essentially. Okay. Um, now, on the other hand, you could actually analyze very simple algorithms uh, like a naive spectral one, where you would just look at the top eigenvector of the matrix and then you would round its entries. Okay. Um, this is a very simple algorithm, and uh, we can basically establish that. If lambda is actually much bigger than one over rho, uh, then this algorithm will also start working. Okay. Now, of course, you might say, okay, maybe your analysis for this is, is kind of loose. Maybe one can do something more clever and we can try to maybe achieve, uh, you know, have reliable support recovery uh, with a feasible algorithm uh, closer to the threshold of one over square root rho. Okay. But my main um, sort of thesis is that I'd like to convince you that this might not be actually possible. And we'd like to explain why we believe it would be hard to achieve the MLE threshold as such. So what happens for intermediate row, right? Um, to understand this better, uh, we'll introduce this uh, restricted likelihood function, okay? So what it does essentially is that it, it basically maximizes the likelihood but it does so subject to an additional constraint. And here we essentially constrain the overlap with the truth to be around some constant value Q. Okay, so recall that V is the planted vector that we are looking at and uh, we constrain this overlap to a certain value. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, can you see this again? Yes, we can see the sign okay, again. Great, sorry. Um, yeah, so now one of our main technical contributions here is that we can actually identify um, a deterministic limit for this restricted likelihood function for every value of Q, okay? 
I'll not go into the details of what this formula is, but this is some deterministic formula that we can write down. Um, one point that I'd like to emphasize here is that note that this restricted likelihood function is not something that you can compute practically given the data. So this is not some estimator, but rather this is a, a proof device that you can think about uh, to understand the complexities of the problem. Now, naturally, given uh, this deterministic formula, we can try to analyze um, the behavior as rho goes to zero. Okay, and and just so let's let's see how how this problem behaves. Um, in the special case where let's say lambda is zero, right? You don't have any signal in your problem, so it behaves basically like pure noise. And then typical matrices all have overlap uh, rho squared with the truth. And therefore, this problem basically behaves like a unimodal, you know, this function basically is unimodal with a maximum at rho squared. When lambda is actually very, very large, then reliable recovery actually happens in that the global maximum actually occurs at some constant times rho. Um, and, and we would still expect this unimodal picture to persist. It's just that the mode will shift. Um, the interesting regime is sort of this intermediate signal regime. Uh, where we can actually establish rigorously the existence of this non-monotonic behavior. Here, uh, naturally, the global maximum is still at some constant times rho, but uh, there is another local maximizer right past rho squared. It's not exactly at rho squared, but it's sort of close to that. And, and this picture is very evocative because it basically says that if you start some local algorithm at this point, and if you try to improve, you naturally expect that you will get stuck at this first local optimum and it will be hard to reach the global one. Um, we refer to this as a version of overlap gap uh, simply because uh, if you look at the set of uh, configurations that have likelihood above a certain level, then it's overlaps with the truth sort of are in these two disjoint sets. And in some sense, it, it's evocative of the overlap gap property that has been looked at in the context of unplanted problems. Um, and formally, as a consequence of this non-monotonic structure, we can establish uh, certain barriers for local Markov chain type algorithms. So for example, if you want to maximize the likelihood, a natural algorithm would be to run, let's say a global dynamics with respect to a chain, um, which, is, which looks like a Gibbs distribution with beta that is sufficiently large. Um, and the basic punchline here is that if you look at some local Markov chain of this form, and if you try to optimize it, and if you initialize close to random initialization, it usually requires exponential time for it to escape and, and get to the global one. Um, maybe just one word on the proof. Uh, our main technical contribution is in deriving uh, the deterministic formula for the restricted likelihood function and its analysis in the regime where rho goes to zero. Uh, there we basically use uh, recent developments in the analysis of Parisi type formulae uh, for mean field spin glasses. Uh, our results for the recovery thresholds for the MLE, they are more straightforward and they are based on first and second moment method based arguments. Um, so following our result, there have been subsequent developments. So there, there is a set of results by Barbier Macris and Barbier Macris and, and Rush where they analyze the mutual information in this problem in the regime where rho actually goes to zero with n. And more relevant to our work is, is a very recent result, set of results due to Benarus, Wine, and Zadik, who actually an, analyze um, this non-monotonistic behavior in the regime where the size of the planted matrix is uh, sublinear in the size of the ambient matrix. So thanks so much for your attention. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robert.